Well, thanks everybody for being here. I know that uh, the weather's really not nice outside and you guys are spending all your time indoors uh, with, the, with no windows. But um, I wanted to talk to you about something that's really dear uh, to me, which is uh, about internet culture. Uh, if you don't know about me or my company, um, my name is Ben, and I started this company called the Cheeseburger Network. Our websites, I'm sorry, I think the slides are, there you go. Oh, let's go back to the first slide. There you go. That's my Twitter handle, so if you have any feedback, I'd appreciate it. I'm, talk I'm talking about being one with internet culture. And our, my company, the Cheeseburger Network, deals almost exclusively in internet culture with such highbrow websites as Failblog. Uh, I can as Cheeseburger. Very thank you. Thank you. Very motivational. Uh, we run almost 50 sites today, and we run with um, in a little boundary called humor. And we receive submissions from our users to power all of these websites. We get about uh, 19,000 submissions on a daily basis, and we reach about 15 million people uh, every month. So internet culture has a lot to do with computing, right? Because it's on the internet. Well, not only that, it depends on how we use computing power to, do, uh, uh, to change humanity. The first thing is uh, that we are aware of is, is powerful processing, folding uh, proteins, uh, trying to model the weather. That's science. Uh, and computing. We try to push the envelope as to what we can do with computing power, uh, what we can actually find out about nature and about humanity. The second thing we did with computing as, as a society was to create cheap computing. Right? Think of the cloud. It is powerful, yes, but really what we use it for is things like, um, I don't know, sending text messages to your friends for free instead of paying your service provider, or alerting uh, your friends about what you had for breakfast, called blogging, right? So that's what we did with cheap uh, computing power. So if you think of powerful computing as going through the genetic structure of um, a monkey or us and creating a map of how uh, nature actually replicates itself and, and how to cure disease, what cheap computing does is it creates that into something like this, right? It shares the idea about toy making with lots of people, and the idea spreads, and you come up with the Furby, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This is what cheap computing does. It affects everyday humanity in a very different way than powerful computing. And so we've started to combine people and computers together. Instead of just saying, let's talk about science and computers, what can we do with people and computers? If every person had accessibility to computers, what would the world be like? If everybody has accessibility to computers everywhere, what would the world be like? And not only did it change the economy, not only did it change the way we perceive each other, but it also started creating culture that was vastly different than the popular culture that's out there. And this is what I call internet culture. I'll let you read that, or I'll say it out loud. If you had found this sexy 25 years ago, you'd be married to a billionaire. It sucks to be you. This man probably did more to popularize computing and put computing power in the hands of every person than anyone else in history. This man, who we know as a brilliant business person, transformed culture in ways that we didn't understand. Today, when you look at technology, we create things that are known, like products. So I'm going to create Twitter, and uh, Twitter is limited to 140 characters. But what's really fascinating is that when we create a product, the unintended consequences of those products actually are far vastly more uh, uh, powerful than the intended consequence of those products. For example, no one realized that when the internet was created, that you would be using it to caption cat photos <laughs> and sending them to all your friends. And that three weeks later, your grandmother would send you the same photo and tell you how funny it was. <laughs> so the opposite of internet culture is popular culture. Sitcoms, either Evening News, Geraldo, Geraldo Riviera, I remember those, those shows. Well, this is the format of popular culture, the top-down structure of culture making, where a group of people, a small group, decides in vacuum, basically, that we should be uh, uh, watching a series of sitcoms based on a bunch of friends in New York who live in ridiculously outsized large apartment and call it friends, right? And that's what mainstream culture is all about. Let's create a product, sell it to a bunch of people, they'll own the rights to it, and they will market it, and so on. 
Well, we have this culture called hacking. Software developers were really hackers, finding ways to do something that was unintended with a technology called software. Well, we now have what we call subversives, who are people who are trying to hack culture so they can create new meaning. The parody video that you saw was actually an example of what this subversive meaning generation is all about. Take something that is well known and established in popular culture, twist it out of context, put it in a different format, and now you've got a different meaning. That video can be seen straightforward as, you know, that's actually not a bad product, like back in the 60s, or you can look at it and go, oh, that's really ironic and funny, right? That's the subversive nature of meaning. Take a look at this image. Vladimir Putin, one of the most powerful men in the world, and he is just taking off his sunglasses. If you're familiar with CSI Miami, right? Some person decided to upload this photo and caption it and say, coming this fall, CSI Moscow. That's funny to a small group of people who took that co popular cultural image and subver subverted it with political image and said, you know, we've actually got something humorous. And the internet has connected all these people together so that they can actually talk to one another, share their sense of humor. And in fact, what the internet has done in, in creating internet culture is that not only are we serving as a support structure for one another, creating tools, creating a place to publish this stuff, but we are actually serving as inspiration and mentors on how to create more and more internet culture. So unlike popular culture, which is owned by someone, which is relatively one way, and it's broadcast to the masses, internet culture, the culture that we create, is communal. It isn't owned by anyone. The concept of putting uh, captions on cat photos is ironically not patentable. Surprise, surprise. It's owned by everyone who has participated in it. It is, it is subversive. It is out there to twist the meaning of what people with power have to say. It tends to undermine that power. And it's also curated by true fans. It is mass media in that internet has enabled these photos to be spread from person to person uh, to, to reach millions of people. However, the actual act of creating this content belongs to a small group of people who believe in this subject matter, right? So it's almost the complete opposite of internet culture. Things like Facebook are actually helping us understand that uh, the internet is still yet to go mainstream. Internet culture is still not a part of what uh, we understand to be mainstream uh, American or world culture. So we've got things like um, the TV shows, which still reach hundreds of millions of people in the United States. You've got the internet, which also reaches hundreds of millions of people in the United States. What's the difference? Why is one popular culture and why is one this kind of subversive internet culture? If you step outside the bubble of technology today, we live in a very special little universe here. San Francisco, the technical, uh, technical community, tends to view the world in a very different way than mainstream America, for example. And until people stop using or stop viewing the internet merely as a tool, as a piece of technology, something I can use to book flights and buy something, until people stop seeing it that way and start seeing it as a place where I can create culture, where I can actually consume and participate in the creation of content, Internet culture will not come to the masses. And internet culture coming to the masses is actually important because it means that we're taking meaning back from commercialized entities, commercial, uh, mainstream and one-way entities, and being two ways about it, right? Being democratic about the creation of culture is important because we get to decide the message that we believe is meritocratic. We get to decide what our neighbors will see. We get to decide what our children will see. And that's the power of internet culture, that finally, the internet is no longer just a tool, but also a means to create meaning. That is all I have to say. Um, this is my Twitter handle, kthanksby. Uh, and I have a couple of messages, actually. One, I know uh, quite a few have requested to meet with me. Um, I will be actually at Web2 open at 11 a.m. Uh, tomorrow, so please come see me there. And I do have a little bit of gift for you guys. If you reach under your seat, there may or may not be a piece of paper. Um, if you find that piece of paper, please come to my book signing tomorrow and I will be giving you a free copy of our book uh, as a hot dog. Well, thank you very much.